This is a colorful story about an artist who paints with watercolors. It is also the story of a woman who has probable early stage Alzheimer's. The two stories are entwined. Hello, my name is Donna Beveridge. I am that artist and I have Alzheimer's. It's not a diagnosis that I want, but it's one that I accept. I'm here to share my story with you. Note that it's only my story. The story of each person with Alzheimer's is different. As the saying goes, if you've met one person with Alzheimer's, you've met one person with Alzheimer's. Some people look at me and say, you don't look as if you have Alzheimer's. Or they say, I forget things too, as if what I'm dealing with is insignificant. They challenge me to defend my diagnosis as if anyone would pretend to have this progressive terminal disease. Perhaps even you are thinking, she has Alzheimer's? She paints, she thinks, she plans, she speaks to an audience. Without using all my time to relate specific symptoms, let me say that many of my symptoms are not obvious to others. My education and prior strengths in details and organization help me to compensate in effective and creative ways to hide symptoms. For now, I'm a pretty good approximation of who I used to be, at least externally, but I am different. Let me take you back almost five years to the beginning of my life with Alzheimer's. A year prior to my diagnosis, I wrote a poem about my biggest fear. What if I have Alzheimer's? Perhaps you or someone you know has had similar fears. What if? I forget the hours I worked yesterday, and I am afraid. I forget the characters in the book I finished today, and I am afraid. I misplace papers, my purse, checks, and I am afraid. I lose the train of a conversation, struggle to speak the word I want, and I am afraid. I stress over organizational details that used to be easy. I miss the payment of a bill, and I am afraid. I don't tell my friends or my children, I am afraid. I share my fears with my partner. She soothes me, says it's the stress of taking on too much, but I've always taken on too much, and I'm afraid. I know that most people past 50 who forget an appointment or the name of their doctor or where they place their keys consider a possible cause, Alzheimer's and then firmly dismiss it, poo-poo it, chuckle, and turn it into a joke. Convince themselves that it is only the brain's reflexes slowing with age. They tuck their tattered fears into the back of a dark closet where they'll unlikely stumble across them until they go looking for a gift bought on sale months ago or snowshoes after a fresh snow or a larger jacket to cover that extra five pounds. And there it is, next to an old pair of shoes they don't wear anymore, that fear. They try to tame it, pat it on the head, feed it a snack, make a soft bed for it from an old camp pillow. Or maybe they tell it to scoot, leave the closet and the house, back door if you don't mind, and find some other place to live, some other person to scare. As for me, I close that closet door, open a book that I know I'll remember this time, pick up the phone and talk to my son about lilacs or landscaping, anything except Alzheimer's, and sigh with relief that the boogeyman is gone and wasn't it silly that I was afraid? But what if? 
What if I have Alzheimer's is a question I took to my primary care physician in the spring of 2007. I was concerned by troubling symptoms, fear, and a personal awareness of being different. Everyone thought it was stress, except me. I made a list of my symptoms, handed them to my primary care physician, and began to cry. She reserved judgment and sent me to a neurologist. I scored 28 out of 30 points on the mini mental exam, not a significant indicator of Alzheimer's. The neurologist said he didn't believe I had Alzheimer's, but he was concerned that it took so long for me to process and answer questions. The neurologist sent me to a memory clinic for a full battery of tests. In addition to determining my intellectual capacity and deficits, the clinic staff ruled out a learning disability, depression, and mental illness. The tests took two days and were exhausting. The teacher in me was fascinated by the experience, but the person in me was scared because I knew I was challenged by some of the tasks. By the time I returned to the neurologist, he had the results from the memory clinic, plus results from blood work and a CAT scan. He diagnosed me with probable early stage Alzheimer's based on cognitive difficulty in two areas, short-term memory and executive functioning, plus the impact on my job. The way I received this diagnosis was almost more devastating than the diagnosis itself. The neurologist looked at my partner, not me. He spoke to my partner, not me. You should plan for her to be in a nursing home in two to seven years, he said. I felt suddenly like a non-person. He stood up, offering no reassurance providing no resources for me or my partner. Take Aricept and come back in six months, he said, as he ushered me out the door. His receptionist gave me an appointment card and turned her back to me. I felt invisible. I walked out in tears, stunned. Only later did I begin to wonder who I was now who I would become in the future, and where I would find purpose and meaning in my life now. Driving home, we passed a decaying clock tower sitting on the ground in front of an empty mill in Bitterford. That clock tower reminded me that time doesn't wait. Although I had a diagnosis, I didn't really know about tomorrow. All I had was that moment. I decided then and there to live my life while I had time. For me, that meant being open about my diagnosis. Many people try to hide their dementia for as long as possible. Deciding not to hide was an act of acceptance of who I now was. Despite the stigma, and there is stigma, I began spreading the news. First, I told my family. Telling my three children and my grandchildren was the hardest. Then I told friends, and finally my church and other community groups. In my journal, I wrote, news travels like the twittering of sparrows on telephone wires. Soon everyone knew, telling people I have Alzheimer's is now as easy for me as telling them that I have a Labradoodle named Sophie. Telling is not only good for me. Every time I casually mention to someone that I have Alzheimer's, I give that person an opportunity to change his or her preconception of what Alzheimer's looks like. I began to discover ways to cope Deciding to be open about having Alzheimer's was one way. Taking care of legal affairs while I could still participate in decisions was another. My partner and I made an appointment with an elder care lawyer in Portland. 
She listened to us and walked us gently and capably through the making of our wills and powers of attorney. Then we bought a plot of land in the Laurel Hills Cemetery, not far from where we live, and had a stone engraved with a much-loved quote. I love that this beautiful cemetery overlooks the Saco River and blooms with thousands of daffodils each spring. I made an intentional decision to deal positively with symptoms and their impact as they arise. I use Not a Still Life for the name of my art shows and presentations for a good reason. I like to think that I'm not living a still life. Rather, I'm an active participant in my life and I intend to be active for as long as possible. Given that, I determined to stay as well as I can, physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially, creatively. To do that, I feel sometimes as if I need multiple hands, feet, and heads, as well as round-the-clock efforts to keep up. I take medications, of course. Medications and supplements shed some light in a future that looks dark. I tried taking Aricept, but couldn't tolerate the gastrointestinal symptoms. I use the Exelon patch instead every day, in addition to Nemenda and a low dose of sertraline for anxiety. I don't worry about the big stuff, only the small stuff, being late, making decisions, dealing with noise and crowds. After my diagnosis, I got more active. I joined a gym and got fit. I stopped going and became less fit. I went to a weight loss program and lost weight. I stopped going and gained weight. I got a, a wee exercise program. I got a dog who needed exercise. The challenges and opportunities to be fit never end. I joined a clinical trial at Yale University last year. As part of this IVIG trial, I get infusions at home every two weeks and will during the rest of 2012. Every three months I go to Yale for testing. I don't know, of course, if I'm receiving the real deal or a placebo, but I feel as if I'm somewhat stable, if not improving. I came to realize, surprise, surprise, that having Alzheimer's doesn't protect me from having other health issues, such as vertigo, fatigue, headaches, and even severe sleep apnea. These new issues impact my energy and focus and find their way into my paintings. Part of staying well is nourishing my spirit. I continue to attend and support my church, I knit with the prayer shawl ministry group. I meditate sometimes, keep a journal, or write poetry. I walk a small labyrinth I built in my yard. I walk the beach. My dog Sophie is good for my health. She not only gets me out to exercise daily, she provides companionship and a sense of responsibility. Walking Sophie at the beach or the dog park is a gentle way to meet and interact with people. This painting, Living My Life, represents my great joy, life with my partner and my dog. It's about living life no matter what. Having Alzheimer's doesn't mean that life stops. It's about being open to adventures whether camping in a tent in Maine, taking a train across country, or meandering all the way to the tip of Cape Cod. Part of my staying well is pursuing interests. For me, of course, that includes painting, my new passion. Painting is more than an activity to fill my time. It's a way to focus, a way to deal with the emotions of a progressive illness a way to remember my life. When I paint in class, I am not Donna who has Alzheimer's, I'm Donna who paints with other artists. When I paint alone at home, nothing exists except the moment. Painting is my comfort. You might say that painting is my mui. 
It was my daughter who encouraged me to paint after my diagnosis. I had always had creative ideas, but until then I had never drawn or painted. I didn't believe that I could. But I gathered up my courage and called my local adult ed office. I would like to sign up for watercolor classes, I told the clerk who answered the phone. But I have to tell you, I have no talent, I'm terrified, I have Alzheimer's, and I have no intention of painting in class. At my first class, I hid in the back corner, but I did paint. I figured that I could at least paint a background. Then Judith Kinsman, my teacher, handed me three pieces of fruit. I held them in my hands for a while, studying their shapes, and I thought, this isn't scary. These are simply ovals. I dipped my brush into water and color and began to paint. I finished my orange and lemons painting that night, carried it into the living room when I arrived home after class and burst into tears. My partner asked why I was crying. Between sobs, I said, because I had such a good time. That was the beginning to my painting adventure. I have been taking lessons at the Sacco Museum and painting now for more than four years. My watercolors are a way to share my story. I am realistic enough to know that there are tough times ahead. And to be truthful, I have had some fears. Early on, I feared losing my sense of self. That's what inspired this image of my partner, my dog Sophie, and me at the beach. I'm not so sure now that I will actually lose my sense of self. I'm more inclined to believe that who I am will remain even as I progress in my disease. I may lose the ability to carry out many of the activities of my life, I may lose my ability to communicate, but I'll still be me at my emotional and spiritual core. Another fear was being abandoned by others when I'm no longer able to communicate. Then I became familiar with therapist Naomi File. She reaches people who have Alzheimer's through touch, eye contact, and music by validating who they are. Watching her sing to a woman with late-stage Alzheimer's and watching that woman respond brought me to tears and inspired this painting. I worry sometimes if I'll have to go to a nursing home, if there will be enough money to care for me, if my partner will remain healthy, if I'll be a burden on those I love. This image is my interpretation of the struggles to come, trying to navigate my way in an increasingly challenged life. There are other scary images that touch my life. Note that I paint only what compels me, even when it's not pretty, such as learning that my sister has an aneurysm and needs to stop smoking. That makes me consider that there are conditions worse than dementia, at least from my perspective. The day I received my diagnosis was the day the bridge collapsed in Minneapolis. You may not remember that event, but it's indelibly imprinted in my mind. For me, the idea of being crushed to death by concrete, or having an aneurysm, or receiving a diagnosis of terminal cancer is much worse than having Alzheimer's. Occasionally, I think about death. Pastor, hospice worker, chaplain, Dr. Kathleen Rusnak compares learning that you're going to die to hitting a brick wall. She says, what the dying learn about living at the end of life is their gift to us in the midst of life. I was fortunate to hear Dr. Rusnak speak recently. She spoke about the spiritual journeys of those with Alzheimer's and raised questions about what it means to be a person. I was fascinated by her description of neurons in the heart 
and the ability of those with late stage dementia to feel. She urges longer visits as the disease progresses rather than visits that become shorter and shorter, if at all, as is often the case. Kathleen Rusnak is a strong and positive advocate for the care of those with Alzheimer's. Now, I don't want you to think that I spend my time dwelling on fears. I don't. I focus on now so I don't lose sight of who I am. Who am I anyhow? Now, some days I'm not sure. This painting reminds me that I am a partner, mother, grandmother, sister, cousin, niece, friend. I am the family storyteller. For more than 40 years, I have kept and passed on family stories through the character in this painting whom I call Colonel Panda. He is my alter ego. Before Alzheimer's, I was a teacher and literacy specialist. After retirement, I helped create and then coordinated a small nonprofit time bank. I had high energy. I was a multitasker, an organizer, an analyzer, a planner. Since my diagnosis, I've retired from formal work. I no longer multitask my days. I can't. I may do less than I used to, but I'm living fully. That is to say, I am not my disease. I am not Alzheimer's. I am a partner, a friend, a reader, a dog owner, a camper. I am a list maker, a beach walker, a lover of ice cream, and a woman who just happens to have Alzheimer's. Four years after my diagnosis, I miss the person I used to be, flexible, outgoing, a lover of gatherings, a participator in discussions, an early morning riser, an enthusiastic planner, an eager hostess. But I have accepted who I am, a fuzzy-headed woman who doesn't remember what she reads, who doesn't remember to shower unless it's written in her calendar, a woman who is overwhelmed by technology, who has trouble using household appliances, a woman who no longer drives at night and on busy, unfamiliar roads. A woman who relies on structured time and lists, even for the simplest of tasks. A woman who moves at a slower pace, who tires more easily. I remind that woman to keep on walking. You might wonder how these changes impact my life. Not surprisingly, they have resulted in some losses. I've lost the ability to work. I've lost an easy engagement in life. I've lost friends. I've lost my dreams of an extended future. I've lost energy. Compensating is exhausting. But there are also gains. I've gained a state of mindfulness, for example. I finally learned what Thich Nhat Hanh meant by doing dishes to do the dishes. My mind used to be in the future, planning and preparing. Now I pay more attention to the music of my life. And I've gained a sense of deep gratitude for my life. I'm grateful for every day Grateful for the gifts of wonderful people in my life, some of whom I would never have met except for Alzheimer's. Grateful that my mother and extended family passed on to me a positive approach to life. I'm grateful also for continuing opportunities to develop my talents and share my story. Three months after my diagnosis, I was featured on the front page of the Portland Sunday Telegram. A year after that, I appeared in an Emmy-nominated MPBN program, Caring for the Caregiver. I've presented at conferences and workshops through connections with the Alzheimer's Association and Dementia Care Strategies. Midcoast Senior Health Center in Brunswick gave me my first opportunity for a solo art show, a thrilling first. Two other shows have followed at Maine Medical Center's Dana Center and at the University of New England. 
opportunities continue to flow like the falls over Niagara. I do well in part because I have a good support system. First and foremost, I have my wonderful care partner. I prefer the term care partner to caregiver. We're in this together. I also have my extended family, my friends, my church, and other supportive communities. I am grateful for friends in my support groups. I attend two groups, one a therapeutic group at Maine Med's Geriatric Center, and another which is supported by the Alzheimer's Association. It's essential to me to be in community with others with dementia. I sought out that support as soon as I was diagnosed. This tree of life painting represents members of my support groups, each in his or her own fragile bubble. Together, we find community, laughter, hope, and most importantly, truth. Each of these people is important to me. We share our lives and our symptoms. We ask questions and learn from one another. We cry, we laugh, we, we laugh a lot, and we end up feeling better when we leave than when we arrived. Our support groups help us hang onto our lives. I'll close with these words. No matter how I seem to you, no matter what symptoms of Alzheimer's I may exhibit now and in the future, I am a real person, and I'll still be a real person when I've moved beyond early stage Alzheimer's. This painting, Life Light, reminds me of the light that is in each of us who has dementia or who is challenged, and we're all challenged in some way. I believe that my light will continue to shine even when the size of my world has diminished. Thank you for letting me share my story with you. May your own light continue to shine brightly.